good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, CIBE 638, Sedimentation Engineering, and this is class number 052, is the fifth week, the second lecture. And the subject today is more on sediment production on watersheds and streams. So the subject today is sediment production and yield, and I'm going to or intend to cover from um, B15 to B22. Uh, if we don't get there, at least we're going to get down to B20. Okay, let's get started here. The first uh, link that we have is a pictorial on the Mojave River flood of March 2005. I uh, spent some time in Helendale in Central California back in the year 2005, and I was uh, lucky enough, I, I should say, to run into a lady whose name was Linda Hoover. And once she realized uh, that I was a professor over at San Diego State, she said, oh, I have a bunch of pictures from the flood, from the recent flood on the Mojave, and I can give them to you. So I said, sure, go ahead. And so she went home and got a CD, loaded a CD with um, a bunch of uh, pictures that she had taken uh, the month of March of the year 2005 when the Mojave went on flood stage. Now the Mojave River is an ephemeral river, meaning it's sandy bottom. You don't see the water unless it rains and it has to rain a lot for the water to run on the surface because otherwise it just percolates through the ground. If it's a small amount, you can't see the river. But in this case, this was a huge flood. It was so huge that it tore uh, up a, a ford that they had built over to cross the river. Now, why do you build a fort? You build a fort in situations where uh, there's little traffic and there's uh, really no need to put a bridge and the bridge will be costly. Traffic is what really mostly determines whether the bridge could be built or not. In this case, they had a nice fort out there. I don't know how long, but the fort gave away or gave away to the river in this flood of March 2005. And I'm going to show you here the various pictures that were given to me by Linda. This is this is the Mojave River at Indian Trail near Hernandale, California, at flood stage. Second picture. Third picture. Here in the second picture, you already see that the banks have already caved. Here the water is going through the ford. You can see the, the road the asphalt road in there. But um, at this point, I believe uh, uh, the fort is, is beginning to fail. Uh, more of the same and more of the same. I should tell you that I did not take these pictures, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure of the sequence, but these are all the pictures that she gave me. Again, the road is closed here. You can't uh, go through the fort because it would be dangerous. You could be swept by the current. Uh, over here, more so. Uh, you can see very swift current in there. Uh, and uh, more of the same thing. And at this point, uh, the, the fort is being destroyed. It could have taken maybe an hour or two, but eventually it was destroyed. Over here, you can see the, the tremendous amount of water over there. Uh, I would estimate at least three feet or four feet of, of depth. More pictures of the Mojave. This is afterwards, and this is afterwards too. It, this could have been the next day. Uh, Linda Hoover lived within, say, a thousand feet of this site, right uh, close to the crossing of Indian Trail and, and the Mojave River at Helendale in Central California. More pictures, and you can see now on the right side over here, the, the bank, the bank uh, is now vertical, vertical. It's a vertical bank. More pictures, and this is uh, downstream, I believe. This is the, uh, the way the downstream valley would look, I believe, after perhaps the next day or even that same night. So those are the pictures given to me by Linda Hoover. 
And uh, when I was there, I was there in June. I had something to do it in Hellendale. I don't remember what it was. It was a, some kind of conference. And, um, and I was there in June and I took the pictures of the river. I went to the river uh, because Linda told me about it. So it was just within a couple of miles from the, from the town. So I went on the river and I took these pictures. This was three months after the flood in June. And this is now the way the Mojave River looked, like the way it always looks. Only that here, you can see the cut. The road had been completely cut. Uh, the distance was, I do believe I have a picture, I'm hoping. No, it's not here. Well, I, for some reason, it's not in this collection. But I do believe I have a picture which shows that uh, the distance in here from the top to the bottom is about five feet. That's my estimate. And this is a picture of the Mojave River three months later uh, downstream. This is at, at Vista Road, Hellendale. I believe this is uh, downstream of the site where we were and um, uh, where we were, not, not where we were, the home of Linda Hoover. And uh, as you can see, the Mojave here is not showing completely dry because that depends the whether they're gonna you're gonna find surface water or not that depends on the morphology of the river. In this particular case, the um, the groundwater is, has not dried out completely from the surface. So that's one example. In here, I have some more pictures about uh, uh, stream restoration. This is restored Clark Creek Clark Creek in Plumas County. Uh, I had worked for many years with the people up in Plumas County that uh, are taking up the job of restoring uh, the watersheds and the streams. There's another stream in here, Last Chance Creek in Plumas County, that has been restored by the, um, by the design uh, or the procedures that they have out there and that they have been using for the last 10 years. Plug and pond, or pond and plug stream restoration at Ferris Creek in Plumas County. Over here we have a fish passage channel that restore Ferris Creek in Plumas County. And that's the end of that. Well, in this collection of pictures I have uh, Oroville, Lake Oroville, a picture that I took maybe 20, 25 years ago. And at the time I was there, I was surprised by the size of the emergency spillway at Oroville. I thought it was the biggest I have ever seen. And in fact, it was, probably. No, I have ever seen doesn't mean that around the world I haven't seen all spillways. But this one was a large spillway. I believe at the time it was the largest spillway, overflow spillway in California. Unfortunately, on February 10, 19, I'm sorry, not 19, 2017, this spillway failed miserably. It really failed terribly. I'm sure you guys are aware of the event. Uh, ooh, this, we were lucky, the state of California was lucky that the reservoir was full. The two spillways failed and then the rain stopped. Because I told my students in the class the next day, I, I, I used to teach a class in open channel hydraulics. I said, had the rain continued, it would have been a major disaster. Maybe the breaching of, the, of Oroville's dam. Oroville Dam is, at the time, it was among the largest, if not the largest, in terms of height. It has 720 foot height dam, and the dam was earth fill. And if you overflow an earth fill because the two spillways have already failed, that that means major disaster, disaster, major trouble for the downstream folks. Next, we are going to be uh, covering this paper called Influences of Vegetation and Watershed Treatment of Runoff, Silting, and Erosion. Um, this was a, a paper that was put together by the Soil Conservation Service in the year 1940. Uh, let's remind ourselves that the Fo Soil Conservation Service was created by the United States government around 1935-36 because of the Dust Bowl uh, problem, or I guess you could say fiasco, over in um, Oklahoma, the, the western central plains of the United States. They, uh, 
they went, uh, they developed the land and they replaced the natural grass, which has a certain roughness, for wheat. They covered a lot of hectares or rather acres in, um, in wheat. And that led to, among other things, coupled with drought and coupled with um, uh, basically drought. Uh, it coupled with that, it led to the, to the event which lasted 10 years. It was a 10 year drought. And it uh, basically destroyed the soil of the region and it took it somewhere else. We don't know, probably the ocean. Uh, the closest ocean is, we don't know because they could have gone it Pacific, Pacific or Atlantic because this particular point is right in the middle of the United States at about the same distance from either the Pacific or the Atlantic. So this publication um, is in PDF form and it's hard to read. So what I did for the purpose of teaching, I abstracted the publication and uh, I have it in here on, with an HTML form so that we can read it. We can even go ahead in here and expand the size a little bit if we care to do so. So I'm going to go over the major points of this paper so as to drive home some of the basic issues that have to do with watershed treatments, effect of watershed treatments on runoff, silting, and stream flow. Why watershed treatments? Well, the Soil Conservation Service, after their creation, were given the job to control erosion. And they felt that the only way they could do that at the time was with watershed treatments. So that's what they're going to be doing. As I already told you, this paper was published in 1940 five years after the Soil Conservation Service was given the job to doing something to fix the problem in the Midwestern United States, the erosion problem, the soil erosion problem in the Midwestern United States, where these people took their time for a while. And like I said, in 1940, the record shows that this paper was published. In 1989 and 1990, when I was given the job to study base flow in Northern California, Base flow augmentation in Northern California. I, I did with a couple of students, uh, went to the library for three months at the time, there was no web. And we spent three months in the library the entire 1989 summer researching the literature on the issue of base flow. We knew that there, the ratio of papers on base flow to the papers of, on floods, which was about 1%. In other words, for 100 papers in flood, there was one in base flow or even less. But we were able to find about 150 papers that directly or indirectly led with base flow, which was not a whole lot, but enough for us to develop a study. So that's what we did. But among the papers that we ran into doing that research in the library, the good old way, was this paper. When I read this paper, it kind of opened my eyes because there's a lot of things in here that I was hearing for the first time. I had been in hydraulics from 73 to 89, 16 years. And some of the things that I'm going to say today, I had not heard at that time. So I learned a lot and I, I'm hoping that all of us will learn today. So the relationship between land use and runoff have followed logging, cultivation, burning, and grazing. So every time there's anthropogenic effect that there's a problem that needs to be contended with. Logging is cutting wood for construction. Cultivating is agriculture. Burning, burning is part of the anthropogenic action and is, it could also be um, uh, natural, but it does happen. Uh, here in California, for the last few years, we've been having a lot of forest burning. And we do not know exactly, we have a hunch that it's related to global warming, but we can't at this point pin it down completely. Grazing, overgrazing, uh, too many animals, cattle, sheep, goats on the range. Too many. So that's something that we need to control. Overgrazing is a bad word. It should be avoided at all cost. Even the more precise engineering calculations have the limitations in dealing with runoff. That's what they're saying in here, and they are correct. Uh, you can apply a method. But if you don't know the method, of you, if you apply it wrongly, you get a wrong answer. As they say something in the vernacular, they say, G-I-G-O, gigo, garbage in, garbage out. 
the water cycle. We are pretty familiar with the water cycle. Uh, so I'm not going to stress on this too much at this point. On a global average, evapotranspiration amounts to about 70% of precipitation. The rest is runoff. So out of 100 units of water supplied by nature through rain, the vegetation and the ecosystem are taking about 70%, 30% left for us. Is the 30% all of it left for us? No, of course not. We need to leave something for the river, for the biota in the river. Only in the last 30 years have we, have we realized and done something about this. There is some, such a thing called the ecological discharge, which a lot of people consider that it's about 10%. So if you could take the 10% out of the 30, then we're left with a 20% of rainfall, which we could use. Are we using that much, much or more or less? And the answer is probably in developed societies such as California, we're mostly using all of that 20%, perhaps even encroaching upon the rest, the rest of the 10%, which should be left out there. More and more, of course, environmental principles and, and regulations are being applied. So there's a lot less uh, misuse now than there used to be before the environmental movement got started about 50 years ago in the United States. Now, entrance to water into this of water to the soil is called infiltration. What is stored underground is called groundwater. We know a lot about infiltration. We already talked about extensively also about groundwater. Groundwater eventually discharges to seeps and springs, except in closed basins. I think it was Libovich that said in his book, the hydrology book, uh, 1979, entitled Water Resources of the Earth. He said that 98% of the, of the flow was going to come out. In other words, only 2% could be considered loss to the system, which he, of course, proceeded to neglect because 2%, that 2% varied between 0 and 5%. It was too, too difficult to assess in, on a local situation. So we're neglecting in our, in our calculations the um, deep percolation, and, but realize that the rest, 98%, is going to come out eventually. How? It seeps and springs. That is why when we pump excessively the groundwater, uh, the, re the e immediate result would be that the springs in the neighborhood, in the vicinity, are going to dry up. That's true, by the way. It's been verified in many, many instances. Excess water flows as runoff. And there is all uh, entire body of knowledge about how to calculate runoff. We manipulate infiltration, yes, by the urban situation is, has totally manipulated infiltration. Do we manipulate evapotranspiration? Yes, completely. The first one, infiltration through paving, and the second one through changes in land use. The original land use, or most of the land use in the, in the world was forest. That was maybe millions of years ago, say 10, 20 million years ago, it was all forests. But then where the weather changes or changed, and in fact it does change, and the forest couldn't be sustained, so that opened up the case for graze land or grazing land. Um, range, what we call range to pasture, which is not forest. Eventually, about 10,000, 11,000 years ago, human, the human race developed a way to do agriculture, meaning uh, feed ourselves more because population was obviously increasing, societies were being formed. The Chinese invented agriculture 11,000 years ago, obviously in China. So then that was another replacement of an ecosystem range for agriculture. You can also replace forest for, replace forest for agriculture, but that's a little more difficult. It's easy to replace range for agriculture. That's exactly what happened in the Midwestern Uni or Central United States in the 1930s, uh, the settlers, the new settlers, because that was new settlement for the United States that was moving from east to west. They started um, using uh, agriculture. I mean, they, they developed the land for agriculture. The land was pasture, meaning grazing lands. And they developed it for agriculture. They caught, they, without control, that procedure caused a lot of trouble later on. Coupled with perhaps the the drought. It just exacerbated the drought. The drought was going to come. We know for a fact that drought is always there and it can come at any time. We also know that as sure as it, as it comes, it will soon leave. 
drought durations vary between two, three, five, per five years. In five years, five to six years is considered to be a maximum. But there are situations where the, the drought could exceed the maximum, the so-called maximum. One case here in the United States, 10 years in the Central Plains, 1930 to 1940. Another case was the one of the Sahel drought in Africa, 1970 to 1987. It has been shown extensively by many studies that the Sahel drought was not supposed to be that long. Uh, its length, 17 years, was exacerbated by anthropogenic action. I, I can't get into detail at this point because it would take too long. We know the hydrologic cycle. I'm not going to click there. Well, let's do click it. That's a hydrologic cycle. That's a hydrologic cycle of, of this report. And that has been recently uh, improved with the, with the Budico model, by the way. This is the Budico model, which is a cybernetic uh, hydrologic cycle. We cover that ground in our course of hydrology. Land storage of water, yes. The Earth's is relatively porous body capable of absorbing and holding a tremendous water, quantity of water. Um, the uh, gentleman uh, from Russia, 1953, uh, Chebotarev, he did a lot of work and he estimated that the 10 kilometer layer of rocks on the surface of the Earth was cracked because of earthquakes and it was holding water. So we said, he said, there's 10 kilometers of water. There's a lot of groundwater out there. The only problem, he said, was that it is salty. The deeper the groundwater, the saltier it gets. We would, we, could, we would have to spend 30 minutes explaining why, and we're not going to, but that's the point. Uh, salt has a way of getting into water, and the longer there's more time and more space, the more salt. That's all there is to it. So the deeper water is, ha, has been subjected to more time and or more space, and therefore is saltier. Um, how salty should be the water so that we could drink it? Well, typical tap water usually runs between 200 and 300 ppm. Here in San Diego, our tap water is 475. It's a little saltier. Why? Because 50% of our water comes from the Colorado, and the, Colo the Colorado River is running at 750 to 800. So by the time we combine the Colorado River with 800 ppm with the northern water, which comes with 200, that's clear water, nice water. We got about 500 here in San Diego. So our tap water in San Diego is not that good. I certainly don't drink it. I have a system by which we purify the water, take the dissolved solids out of it. You can also buy bottled water, or you can buy just go ahead water in bulk, whichever way you want to do. Uh, the idea is not to drink the water that is too salty because that could lead to problems in later life. Mostly high pressure, high blood pressure, and many in other ailments such as that. Okay, groundwater storage. The soil profile holds water temporarily until it is partially recovered through springs and wells. In other words, the water is always moving. Groundwater is always moving. That is, was mentioned at the beginning. Um, groundwater is not groundwater if it's not moving, because if it's not moving, it ponds up and then it, it evaporates. It goes, it runs on the surface and it evaporates. So groundwater is always moving. Average depths of groundwater. Meinzer did a study in 1927 uh, throughout the entire western United States, and he came up with the number of 27 feet. Now this one is 37 feet, but it's this is for the U.S. And uh, this was a little later, though, 1940. So it's interesting. Uh, the Meinzer book has not been read a whole lot, so maybe the people that wrote this uh, report were not aware. Perhaps they were not aware of the Meinzer book. We have read the Meinzer book extensively, and I did cover it last year when we taught uh, environmental hydrology. The character of flood-producing rains, there are two types of rains, local and general. For instance, the storm of October 30, 1983, which I had uh, fortune to study extensively and develop a routing model for that storm, covered about 50,000 square miles. Interestingly, the storm created a flood of 80,000 CFS, which was about three times larger than the maximum 
of record at the time. Uh, in the state of Arizona, in the year 1983, they had 80 years of record. 80 years of record, right, from 1903 to 1983. Nothing before 1903. There was no Arizona, the state of Arizona at that time. But uh, we analyzed the 40, the 80 years of record and came up with the normal numbers of 27,000 CFS. And yet the, the event of October 30, 1983 was 80, 85,000. How did that happen? Well, we would have to go back and read my article or my paper of the time. But what happened, there was a combination of um, uh, uh, rain or mass of water coming from, from the uh, Gulf of Mexico, which collided with a huge mass of water that was coming from the Pacific and that was related to El Nino. 1983 was the strongest El Nino of the century in the Pacific. Caused a lot of trouble in Peru, by the way. So um, this, um, these two great masses of air, wet air, collided and produced this huge flood in so over southeastern Arizona. Covered a thousand, I'm sorry, 50,000 square miles. Factors affecting soil infiltration. Porosity is one. Organic matter. Organic matter is an interesting concept because it's good and bad. It's good if it's a matter of infiltration for hydrology purposes. It is bad if you're going to build something on top of it. You don't want any organic matter because the building would settle. Uh, what is the percentage of organic matter that would be acceptable? Typically in geotech engineering, less than 5% would be, well, it would be fine if there's organic matter less than 5%. But their organic matter can be 20, 30, 50, 80%. I have seen soils that are 80 to 100% organic matter in some places. Um, we used to dig, dig holes, uh, uh, exploration holes for a living many years ago, by the way, more than 40, 50 years ago, and we saw quite a few pits where 80 to 100 percent of the soil was organic matter, or rather the organic matter, the soil which was organic matter, basically, peat or muck, was 80 to 100 percent um, solid. Plant roots, plant roots form channels. Yes, totally and completely. That this is where uh, Roger Smith, um, who um, proposed uh, our replacement of the runoff curve number for the uh, Phillips equation, uh, is is wrong, because a large portion of the infiltration process is that is done through roots, root and root decay. And if we not, don't consider that biological part as part of the equation, we're not considering the whole thing. So infiltration is not just physical. It is also biological. Furthermore, it is chemical. So the physical approach to infiltration is not complete. Plant and animal life. Oh, boy. Animal life all over the place. If we don't consider the animal life in the plants, we're not doing the right thing. Darwin himself estimated that 50,000 worms inhabit an acre of ground. This must have been in, in England, by the way. I figured, I don't know the details, but Darwin was an Englishman. Uh, so that's all, there's a lot of worms out there. The worms sit at the top of their ecosystem, and, but below ground. They eat everything up. They produce, they, they turn the soil around. Uh, they make the soil uh, workable, active, and livable but, uh, by other bugs and so forth and including us, of course, they, they fertilize the soil with their, with their remains, or rather, with their remains. Slope and soil influence. Slope is also important. Infiltration after saturation. And here, I am going to quote in here Lauder Mill's quote, which is an important quote, and that's, uh, that's why I put it in red. When a drop of rain strikes the ground covered with vegetation, it breaks into a spray of clear water, which finds its way into the numberless interstices and channels of the soil. But when it strikes bare soil, formerly developed under a mantle of vegetation, the force of the drop causes it to take up particles into suspension. It becomes a drop of muddy water. As this water sinks into the soil, the fine particles filter out at the surface to form a thick film which chokes the surface pores of the soil. Then, only a part of the drop filters into the soil. Another part is left unabsorbed and flows over the surface. The accumulation of infinite unabsorbed drops 
on sloping land gives rise to superficial storm flows. In other words, Laudermilk is saying that it, vegetation has a way of protecting the splash, or rather protects or uh, minimizes the effects of the splash of rain, because if there's no vegetation, then the splash is going to cause erosion, local erosion, minute local erosion. The erosion is going to is going to produce soil, salt, sand, silt, clay, and that's going to go uh, disaggregate and then eventually fill the pores on the surface and not allow the water to infiltrate anymore. I have not seen that description as clear as that uh, written up to that point anywhere else, by the way. Interception, not too important for flood hydrology. It's important for yield hydrology, annual hydrology. How much water is there in a watershed in one year, but not for flood. 90 to 95% of the work that we do as engineers is related to flood, not to yield. Yield is out there. We always need to know how much water is there. But there's a lot more work, activity, economic uh, funding in floods. Water consumed by vegetation. This is a fascinating subject. And we will have a chance to come back and discuss this now, later on, not just in this class, but in the other class I'm teaching, which is surface water hydrology. Consumptive views of vegetation related to soil fertility, etc. Absorption by plant litter. Plant litter is good, so you have to have vegetation and plant litter. The plant litter will absorb the, uh, the moisture and would um, serve like a sponge to hold on the moisture, which eventually, uh, if, it, if it does not evaporate, it will filter down slowly but surely. Retardation of snow melt protection for freezing. Consequences of change in, vegeta in vegetal cover. I'm going to go a little, a little faster in here, but I do not want to go any further without showing this graph in here. The effect of clearing and cultivation without employing water and soil conservation practices is illustrated by measurements at Ithaca, New York, preceding the 1936 flood of a tributary on the Susquehanna River. Here we have grass, 20% 20, 20 slow. Grass. With grass, there's little soil loss, little water loss. Good. With forest, 27% slope, roughly the same. Zero loss, zero water loss, because the forest is, is decreasing the energy of the, of the rain and so forth. And over here, potatoes still up and down the slope, which is the way it should not be done. 14% slope, not that high compared to the others, but still high enough. Water loss, 88% soil loss, 1,000 pounds. Conclusion, if you do agriculture, you do it this way, you'll ruin the land in no time. Have I seen this kind of stuff? Actually, I traveled in various places throughout South America, but I was in Ecuador many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and I saw this uh, till, uh, land, agricultural land till up and down the slope. Why? Because apparently, I haven't been there, but apparently it's easier to do. It's easier, but it won't last a couple of years. After that, all the soil is gone. Okay, um, fire damage, yes, we have fire and um, Logging, yes, also in the United States, we build uh, typical houses with wood. So we got to get the wood out uh, for construction. And that causes a problem because uh, society is always looking for new wood because there are always new housing. And we have to go out there and log the forests. In California, a lot of our forests have disappeared already. And nobody really knows exactly what's going to happen in the future. There's going to be regulation, but it's going to be difficult to implement. Overgrazing. Here. Um, this one is kind of hard to understand. Comparison of surface runoff and sediment eroded. Oh, yeah, this is the sediment eroded. And it kind of shows in here. Um, well, this is kind of a difficult one to understand. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, over here, this one's good. Um, dense mat of, root, of fine roots near the surface of the soil serves best in protecting the soil from erosion and in obtaining maximum absorption. In here in the bunch, bunch grass, 35% uh, density, this is the natural, natural situation. Here, the runoff is hardly anything, the silt hardly anything. This is the kind of stuff that was happening in the, in the um, central states around Oklahoma in the 30s. 
prior to development, prior to agricultural development. Then we have this downy chest, which is a weed, but it produces a, some sediment. The needle grass lupine, 30% density, also produces some black in here, which, is, which stands for eroded material. And for the annual weed, if there's no water, only the weeds can survive, and the weeds don't have any roots, and therefore you're going to have a lot of eroded material. This graphical picture cannot depict it better. We now know that that is the case. Silting, shoaling of channels, damage to flat plains, strip cropping. Uh, the issue of strip cropping is uh, a methodology that was developed by the Soil Conservation Service extensively in the 30s and 40s to provide management of soil erosion. In this way, the soil can be controlled. Why? Because it rains and if, if it runs off, it cannot get out of the strip because it's been like detained. So the water will stay on the premises. And that's exactly what we want to do. We do not want runoff. We want run uh, water staying on the premises. This picture, I lucked out. I was in um, Colorado back in the year 1989, 1990. And um, this was a picture of a project uh, in the 1930s in the Wasatch Mountains. Um, Pre President Rose Roosevelt had implemented the New Deal. Among the New Deal was the Work Powers Administration, which employed uh, people that were unemployed and put them to work in construction. In this case, you can see these young men or these gentlemen are actually constructing terrace trench systems in the Wasatch Mountains. Well, let me tell you this. In 1930, they had a huge flood, moved a lot of sediment, and they have an avalanche downstream at the mouth of the basin, covered about 10 feet of, 10 feet of ground was elevated by the avalanche. Since that, since then, that event, uh, the government, the local people built these trenches and they have not had another avalanche for the last 90 years. So this is a very effective. In other quarters, this is called micro relief, by the way. So you hear micro relief in various areas. It's this. It's a very work intensive uh, project. But if you must do it, you should do it. And it will be very good. Uh, terraces. Yes, over here. H old agricultural terraces. I was in India and I took this picture. And all check dams, oh, check dams that are built uh, in the various projects that we examine, examined in the year 1989, 1990, um, out there in Alkali Creek, they had built 133 of these check dams, just like these, to hold on to the water, not let the water run. Uh, in Trout Creek, uh, they put things like this, or in the thousands out there. They also fix the watershed. Beavers are in the business of holding water. Why? Because they want to hide from the predators. And they, since they are amphibious, they know that uh, the, uh, the predators are, gonna, are not going to follow them underwater. So they build dams in order to protect themselves. Unfortunately, these people, or, or rather the beavers, are very good hydraulic engineers because you can see that dam, even though it was built uh, almost precariously, it's not leaking. It's holding the water. So it's very good hydraulic engineering. But they don't know anything about hydrology or the frequency of floods. So if and when there is a flood in here, the flood will actually take this up because they have no overflow spillway. Not only that, but when there's a uh, failure of this dam, the other ones downstream will also fail. And these, uh, the beavers typically build several dams together. So that's um, the story on that. So we have a video in here on how the Incas pump the water, which I am going to show in here. In 1984, I traveled to Denver to visit an acquaintance from my college days at Colorado State University in the early 1970s. In the evening, we went to a slide presentation in the local community center. A lady was showing the pictures she had taken in a recent trip to Peru. Among the photos were several slides of the terraces of Pisac, without a doubt, some of the most impressive and best preserved agricultural terraces built by the Incas. At the end of the presentation, in response to questions from the audience, she proclaimed, 
Nobody knows for sure how the Incas pumped the water from the streams to the terraces. Obviously, she had missed the fact that the terraces held a runner, eliminating the need for pumping. Obviously, right. The, the Incas had no way of pumping. They just held a runner on the terraces. And this terracing uh, technology, so to speak, uh, was developed in many cultures around the world, in India and many other places. I've already shown you examples. Next paper is a review of the application of the muscle model worldwide. We already reviewed the ASL model, USLE, so-called USLE model, developed in the mid-60s by Wishmeyer and Smith of the Agricultural Research Service, which basically was a conceptual model based on empirical data. Baltimore put together five factors, R, K, S, L, E, and P, and uh, C and P. Uh, but that gave only the annual yield of sediment based on the data, not the event yield. So it was more like, um, like um, a piece of information the, uh, that ag engineers would uh, use. As a matter of fact, I believe that Wishmeyer and Smith may have been ag engineers, agricultural engineers. Subsequently, though, time went by, and civil engineers wanted to get an estimate of the, of the um, sediment yield, meaning per event. And of course, the uh, USLE does not do that. So that in 1975, one of uh, the researchers out there, I believe it was Williams, I believe he was working at the time for the Army Corps, but I could be wrong. Developed the muscle equation, M-U-S-L-E, modified universal soil loss equation. And, uh, and it, that method has been used for 30, 40, 50 years. It's, it is used up to this day because there is no substitute. Actually, I take that back. There is the Dendian Bolton formula, which we already covered which is a substitute, but many people felt that the Dendian Bolton formula was too coarse and they wanted to go in more detail into the calculation of the yield. So Williams modified the USLE and converted into into MUSLE and uh, so be it. And there's a lot of practice and experience on the method, on the muscle method. In here, I show you a review of the application of the muscle model worldwide. There's a few people, professors out there in Iran. I believe all these four, four authors of this paper are professors out there. They list their affiliation with different, different, different universities in Iran. So they wrote this paper reviewing, analyzing the, the, the muscle method. And they basically, I read this in detail a few times, and they basically came to the conclusion that um, there's a lot of places where there's stuff that we don't know. We don't really know exactly why is it that the method doesn't work in many, in many instances. The answer, of course, I have the answer for that, and I can give you the answer. This is the method. The muscle was given in the following general form. What Williams did in 1975, right there, Williams, is he replaced the R by this function in here in order to account for the event. The K, L, S, C, and P, he left the same. So then the question is, what is this stuff in here? This is a, um, S is the sediment yield, right, on a storm basis, meaning for an event. Q is the volume of runoff. Q sub peak is the peak flow rate. So here, Q, the volume of runoff, and Q sub peak, peak flow rate. So he multiplied, how fascinating. The peak flow rate with the volume of runoff, because both of them have an effect on the yield, right? And he put them in there, but he could not obviously put that in there because it would have been without dimensions. I mean, you can't fit the dimensions in there. Um, and therefore, he decided to make this thing empirical by adding A and B, A coefficient and B um, exponent. Let me increase the size of that, right? So this problem then you know, this model deteriorated from conceptual which it was conceptual at the time it was universal soil loss equation but by the time it becomes muscle because of the a and b parameters 
which have to be determined empirically or somewhat out there, graph from somewhere, that this problem becomes empirical. And that's why typically I don't stress too much about it. Uh, in my class, I don't like empirical equations because then it's like going and saying, go find, go find the values and you're on your luck. You're on your own if, you're, if you cannot find the right values. You know, you're on, the luck is yours, I guess you could say. But the point is that um, I did add this method as part of our work that we're doing in this class, and therefore I decided to uh, cover it briefly. As you can see, the, the methodology is very exhaustive. The comparison of about many, many, many cases in here. I have not looked at how many, but I would say at least 50, if not 100 cases over here. It doesn't say in here quite right. Anyway, it doesn't say. So with that, then, I am going to um, finish over here this paper. Uh-oh. Lost it. Did the wrong thing. Okay, so the next paper I'm going to review in here is a video, actually. Uh, we have a paper, and then, and then we, we have a paper over here, and then we also have a video. I'm going to start with the video, and then I'll... I'll finalize with the paper if we have time. It looks like we're going to have a little bit of time here. That's good. Hold on because this is a 15 minute 15 minute video. The various tributaries of the Amazon River may be generally classified according to the color of their waters into three distinct types. One, white. Two, black. And three, clear. This video features the following major tributaries, Solimois with white waters, Negro with black waters, and Tapajos and Xingu with clear waters. The different colors of the waters is explained in terms of the geological, geomorphological, hydrological, and ecological characteristics of their respective drainage basins. The Amazon Basin is the largest in the world, encompassing approximately 7.5 million square kilometers in South America. The basin is also the largest source of fresh water, with a mean discharge of approximately 220,000 cubic meters per second at its mouth. It constitutes about one-sixth of all the fresh water that flows into the oceans. Located in the tropics and mostly covered by forests, 68% of the basin area lies within Brazil. The remaining 32% covers parts of the following eight countries, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, French Guiana, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela. The waters of Amazon rivers feature different colors, which are red. This site over here is called, is called the Meeting of the Waters near, near Manaus, Brazil. I was there once back in 1968, I believe, 68, right. Completely discernible. Native pre-Columbian inhabitants classified the rivers attending to the color of their waters. They knew that the color of the water indicated differences in its quality, fish resources, soil fertility, and the presence or absence of mosquitoes. Subsequently, scientists used river color to classify Amazon rivers into four types. One, clear water, Rio Claro. Two, black water, Rio Negro or Rio Prieto. Three, white water, Rio Branco. And four, green water, Rio Verde. The first attempt to develop a scientific classification of Amazonian rivers was performed in the 1950s by Harald Scioli. He used the color of the waters as well as various physical and chemical characteristics to explain the limnological properties of major Amazonian rivers. Sciolo related these characteristics to the geological and ge So in here we have the brown rivers are carrying a lot of sediment because it's coming up, it's coming from the Andes Mountains over here. The uh, rivers over here in Colombia and Venezuela, a little bit of Venezuela, mostly Ecuador, are black because they are coming from flatlands that have no sediment 
but there is a lot of vegetation out there that is producing humic substances which are have the color black they're black in color so therefore the color of the water is black and over here the blue this is what Sioli has called the clear waters why are these rivers here why don't they have either black or brown and the answer is because they're running over cratons there's two cratons in here the brazilian craton or shield shield or craton is the same name and the Guyana Shield over here. Both this Guyana Shield and the Brazilian Shield produce rivers that are basically clear. Among them, the Trombetas, very well known, the Xingu, the Juruena, the Tapajós is a very clear river. Geomorphological properties of the contributing drainage basins. Scioli established three types of water color in major Amazonian rivers. One, clear, two white and three black. Let me say that I'm not Seoli, but I wouldn't use those names. But I guess when he did this, he was a very well respected gentleman. I believe he was Brazilian and uh, I could be wrong. Yeah, I, he was Brazilian. And he um, he called it clear when it in fact is green, white when it in fact is brown and black is kind of black, purple, I guess you could say. But this classification is the one that has withstood the passage of time. More recent hydrochemical data indicates that the chemical composition of Amazonian water bodies is much more complex than that originally envisioned by Scioli. However, due to its simplicity, Scioli's classification remains widely used. The color of a river's water is the result of physical and chemical transformations that take place during surface and subsurface runoff. In the Amazon basin, white water draining from the Andes Mountains, for example, the Solimoes River in Brazil, referred to as the Amazon River in Peru, has a relatively high concentration of nutrient-rich sediments, thus its light brown color. On the other hand, black water, originating in the central northern rainforest, for example, the Negro River, has a high concentration of humic substances, which gives it a characteristic dark black color. Furthermore, Clear water, for example, the Curua Una River, draining the neighboring Brazilian shield region, is patently poor in sediments and therefore transparent, its chemical composition resembling that of rainwater. Most Western Amazonian rivers are classified as white water. The white waters are generally muddy, containing large quantities of sediment, often with a brownish tint. The mainstem Amazon River, referred to the Solimoes River in Brazil, is classified as white water. Important tributaries such as the Juruá, Urus, and Madeira are also white water. The headwaters of white water rivers lie towards the west, in the Andes Mountains of Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia and carry large amounts of nutrient-rich sediments, giving the water its characteristic light brown color. In addition, at the prevailing high temperatures, the mainly alkaline earth metals and carbonates determine the muddy coloration of white waters, with a relatively high value of electrical conductivity. In the upland basins, this value is approximately 100 micro siemens per centimeter, decreasing to 40 micro siemens per centimeter in the lowland basins. Moreover, the pH of white waters is close to neutral. These rivers deposit their nutrient-rich sediment in extensive floodplain areas, referred to as varseas in the Portuguese language. Therefore, the varseas are very fertile and covered by highly productive terrestrial and aquatic herbaceous communities, which reach beyond the varsea forests. The sediments carried by whitewater rivers consist of large amounts of fine grain material. This material increases water holding capacity during a dry phase, but it also impedes soil aeration. The clay fraction contains kaolinite, illite, and smectite. Unlike kaolinite, smectite has a high ion exchange capacity and it releases potassium over time. Both kaolinite and smectite are essential for the fertility of floodplain soils. In mountainous environments, physical weathering is more likely to predominate over chemical weathering. 
Thus, physical weathering of the Andes range conditions the geochemistry of downstream tributaries. Predictably, in the Amazon Basin, about 84% of the total amount of dissolved and suspended solids originates in only 12% of its contributing area, located to the west. The Blackwater rivers, among them the Negro, Judai, Tefe, and Coari rivers, feature much darker color tones. This is due to the soil chemistry and to the local geology, geomorphology, and hydrology. Black waters are poor in nutrients, and the surrounding soil is predominantly sandy, containing large amounts of organic matter, such as humic and fulvic acids, which lend the water its characteristic black color. Although the water surface appears dark in color, collecting the river water in a transparent bottle will reveal a colored tint varying from red to dark brown. The red waters found in the Negro River at San Gabriel de Cachoeira in the central northern Amazon fall into the black water category because they are acidic waters containing a high quantity of humic acids, which give it a reddish brown color. Most headwaters in the northern Negro tributaries have transparent waters with up to 3 meters seki depth, featuring low amounts of suspended matter. They drain the waters originating in the Precambrian shield of Guyana, characterized by large areas of white sands or pot soles. This is the case of the Branco River, a tributary of the Negro River, which has a high load of suspended matter in the appearance of a white water river. However, the chemical characteristics of these rivers indicate that they generally have a low nutritional status and a closer relationship with clear water rivers. They become blackish in color and very acidic after flowing through areas covered by dense rainforest. The German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt referred to these forests as Hylian in the early 19th century. Blackwater rivers feature pH values in the range 4 to 5 and low electrical conductivity, below 20 microsiemens per centimeter. They mainly transport the sandy bed load and a small fraction of low fertility kaolinite. The water is acidic and the amount of dissolved inorganic substances is small. Seki water transparency is about 60 to 100 centimeters, with low amounts of suspended matter and high amounts of humic acids, which give the water a reddish brown color. The amount of dissolved humic substances is about 10 times greater than white water Amazon rivers. The water is poor in nutrients and electrolytes with the predominance of sodium among the major salt cations. The floodplains of blackwater rivers, locally referred to as igapos, feature generally low fertility. Terrestrial and aquatic herbaceous plants are scarce and many typical whitewater species are absent due to either low fertility low pH or both. Sandy beaches suffer severe drought stress due to their low water retention capacity. Downstream of the Negro River, near the confluence with white waters and a greater availability of nutrient-rich sediments, there is a larger number of plants. The larger Amazonian rivers featuring clear waters are the Trombetas, Tapajos, and Xingu rivers. Clear water rivers usually have tones varying from greenish to transparent. They originate in the Amazonian cratons, that is, very old rock formations dating from the Archean period, Precambrian. Therefore, they have very small amounts of sediment. Cratons exist in two regions of the Amazon basin. One, towards the north is the Guyana Shield, and two, towards the center south is the Brazilian Shield. These rock formations underlie a characteristically flat relief with very little surface erosion and low quantities of organic matter. Consequently, the waters are clearer. Large clear water rivers have an electrical conductivity ranging from 10 to 50 micro siemens per centimeter, which may decrease to 5 micro siemens per centimeter for lower order streams. The pH is acidic, ranging from 5 to 7, while the transparency of its greenish waters is over 100 centimeters 
and may exceed 350 centimeters. The floodplains of Clearwater rivers, also referred to as Iga flows, are generally of intermediate fertility. They are covered by a slow growing floodplain forest where litter production is approximately 30% lower than in other forested areas. The growth rate of trees in the Igapos are up to two-thirds lower than those found in the Varsias. Clearwater rivers receive their water mostly from rainfall, with little or no sediment production in the contributing uplands. Their wetlands are generally poor in nutrients. However, their nutritional status may vary due to differences in soil quality in the neighboring cerrados, the tropical savannas of central Brazil. Submerged macrophytes may occur in areas featuring deep light penetration and little water level fluctuation. Thus, the diversity of aquatic microphytes is greater in clear water rivers than in comparable white water or black water rivers. The Amazon Basin as a whole features three major landscapes. One, the Andes Mountains toward the west. Two, the crystalline shields or cratons of Guyana toward the north and Brazil toward the southeast. And three, the sedimentary plains in the central portion, the domain of the Hylian forest. The geological characteristics of the lands where these landscapes are located determine the chemical composition of the waters of the various rivers. Not only are the chemical characteristics quite distinct, but there is also a visual difference. This fact led Scioli to classify the rivers into A. Clear water, B. White water, and C. Black water. Scioli's classification has been supported by botanists and limnologists who found corresponding differences in the occurrence of three species, aquatic macrophytes and aquatic biota, such as snails, bivalves, and other species. The combination of various dissolved solids and chemical characteristics, such as the amount and relationship between alkali and alkaline earth metals, and major anions, bicarbonates and chlorides, electrical conductivity, pH, total nitrogen, water color, turbidity and transparency, enable the identification of three classical types of river water. One, white, two, black, and three, clear. In addition, there are other mixed water bodies of intermediate colors. As the order of the river increases, the complexity tends to be hidden because the river flows provide the integration of all waters, thereby mixing waters of different qualities. The distribution of alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, and of major anions is particularly useful for distinguishing between white water, black water, and clear water rivers. Greater variability is shown by bodies of water that do not fit into the three classical categories. Therefore, many streams and rivers may actually be considered of mixed water type, resulting from the influence of lower order tributaries with different physical chemical characteristics. <laughs> Okay, we have now one more article. The Carquinez Breakthrough. Uh, many years ago, I came across this article by Wong, which is a very good article. I urge you to read it. It has to do with the geology, uh, prehistoric geology of, of the state of California. Fascinating article. It gets into everything in here, by the way. But uh, Kathleen Wong does uh, identify the source, a lot of the source of her work has to do with a, a paper or articles that were put together by a scientist from the Geological Survey. I am trying to find his name right in here. Andrei Sarna Woksitki, Geologist Emeritus with the U.S. Geological Survey. So please take a look at this uh, because it gonna, it's going to fill you in in the history of the uh, old, I guess you could say, prehistoric geology of the state of California. 
Um, I've also looked up Carquines Strait in Wikipedia, and I am now going to tell you exactly what this is all about. Through Wikipedia, of course. We consider Wikipedia to be 98% correct, by the way. So at this point, because of the expediency of Wikipedia, everybody recognizes that. We don't really pay too much attention to the remaining 2%. Nothing's perfect, as people say. The Carquina Strait is a narrow tidal strait in Northern California. It is part of the tidal estuary of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers as they drain into San Francisco Bay. The strait is eight miles and connects Suisun Bay, which receives the water from, of the combined rivers with San Pablo Bay, a northern extension of the San Francisco Bay. So there's a whole connection of bays out there, San Francisco Bay, which is the one that is closest to the ocean. Then we have San Pablo Bay, Suisun Bay, upstream a little bit, and then connected with the Carquinez Strait. The Carquinez Strait is a connection between the Central Valley and the base, right here. Right here. This is the Central Valley of California. Central Valley over here. Carquinez Strait over here. No, that, that was not correct. I did something that is not correct. I tried to. Okay. Okay, again, Central Valley. Carquinez Strait right here in the arrow. And then these are the two bays in here and San Francisco Bay right there. Okay, what's the, the detail of the story is this. The strait, Carquina Strait, formed in prehistoric times near the close of one of the past ice ages when the Central Valley was a vast inland lake. So the Central Valley was not a valley in old times. It was, it was an inland lake. Uh, the gentleman from the GS, USGS has determined, presumably by dating analysis, that about 650 to 670,000 years ago, um, the, uh, the world was subject to uh, warming. And there's a whole lot of floods that were created by ice melting. And one of these floods, or several of them, were, were responsible for actually breaking up the entrance to the Carquina Strait. But there was an issue of luck in here that I'm going to discuss with you. Melting ice from the Sierra Nevada raised the water level, while seismic activity created a new outlet. There was an old outlet around here somewhere, exactly where I don't know. But that outlet was, was uh, eliminated by uplift, geologic uplift through a bunch of years, maybe I don't know, 100,000 years could create uh, enough movement from the Earth's crust that you would, you could plug an outlet. So that's what happened. The natural outlet, which was not a whole lot of water, and it was a certain level, and it maintained the level of the lake at uh, in here, it was uh, eliminated by uplift. And then subsequently, ice melting over here from the Sierras, right? There's a lot of there was a lot of ice out here in the California Sierras, which are over here, and fill the the uh, the reservoir, the lake basically, and it just rushed through the strait and it broke it and it created it created the strait, and it drained the lake in the process of doing that. So there's no more lake. So for the last 670 year, 670 thousand years ago. The lake has not been a lake, but rather it now be, has been referred to the Central Valley. Here we go. Let's finish in here. Andre Sarna Gwosici, geologist emeritus, estimates that the Carquinez Strait was likely formed about 640 to 700 years ago. Let's remind ourselves that the human race, as Homo sapiens sapiens, is only about 200,000. People disagree. Some people say 100,000, others say 200,000 years ago. So this was even before Hugh, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens was walking around here in California. The present Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley were covered by a huge lake, which has been called Lake Corcoran. Initially, this lake drained into the ocean through a valley near present-day Monterrey, so it would be around here somewhere. 
one array. I believe one array is here. So it would come in here and over here. Ongoing seismic activity raised the coastal mountains sufficiently to plug this outlet. It is true. The mountains are always going up. The question is not whether they're going up or not, but the question is at what rate. It could be a millimeter per year, or it could be a millimeter every 10 years, but they're going up. Concurrently, ice melting off the Sierras raised the water level in Lake Corcoran until the lake began to carve a new outlet to the ocean. At some point, the coastal barrier collapsed between today's cities of Crockett and Venetia, releasing water or lake water in a cataclysmic flood. This flood had to be huge. I would estimate at least as much as the Amazon River flood or discharge, or perhaps even more. We have some data that indicates in Utah, in northern Utah, when, uh, when the, there was a lot of melting and the flooding of uh, Salt Lake created a breach, and that the breach of that, uh, uh, that event 14,000 years ago uh, created a discharge which was comparable to twice as much the discharge of the Amazon which is currently estimated at 220,000. So the one in Utah would have been 450,000 cubic meters per second. We obviously don't know about this one in the Sierras, but I am going to guess that it was at least two, if not three times more. But that's just a wild guess. So at this point, I am going to finish here. And let me uh, stop to share. And I'm back here now. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. It was a little varied, different subjects. Uh, so with this, then I'm going to close down the class today, and I will meet you next uh, Tuesday at the customary time at 5.30 p.m. Thank you very much.